Hi, I'm Ross Bentley. Hi, I'm Jeff Brown. And, and this is this is no, no dumb dumb questions. questions. You know what? That sounded almost perfect on our end, but I wonder did, if so I can't in the recording whether it's yeah. going to get that distorted thing again or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I've I've I think we've nailed it a few times, and then I, I go back and listen to it, and I'm like, man, we're way off. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. We'll, one day we'll do one actually sitting next to each other. Well, I guess then there is no excuse for not getting it perfect. So maybe we shouldn't do that. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know what? What one of the most important things in all of motorsport is always have an excuse and always blame somebody else. In this case, right, I can't right. blame the engineer. Hopefully, you can't blame the driver. So we're going to blame the internet. Nope. Right, the internet. You know, I think we blamed Elon Musk once. He counted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been blamed because for lots of, of my things. Starlink, yeah. <laughs> He's easy. Okay, good. You got the blame guy. That deal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, Jeff, let's just jump in because we've got a uh, couple sure. of really cool questions. Awesome. Uh, I have a question then from James who asked, ooh, this is going to be fun. I've heard from a couple of good sources that testing on old or used tires is worthless. Is there no benefit at all to testing on used tires? I'm of the opinion that there is always something to gain from a driver development standpoint. And as long as the tires do not have over 20 heat cycles on them and are, and are worn relatively evenly, then one should still be able to tune the balance of the car for handling characteristics. Oh, yeah. Well, I have some strong opinions on this. Okay. Um, that's, a great, that's a great question, James. I say somebody, so you said somebody said testing on old tires is worthless. I would say testing on old tires is incredibly valuable, possibly way more valuable than on new tires. Colin always complains, always complains. He's like, Dad, how come I can't, how come you never give me new tires? And I would say, well, because you're going to learn more on used tires. When I was paying for them, there was another answer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but as it turned out, the fact that I was a cheapskate actually taught him a lot because he was always on used tires. And my drivers, I'll have drivers come in, you know, and say, "Oh, I need new tires," and I'm like, "All right, you know, he's only have 15 minutes on them, and the race is an hour long. Are we gonna?" pit every 15 minutes during your hour race for new tires if so you better be really fast to make up for stopping three times and they're like well yeah no i guess we're not and i'm like we're gonna spend you're gonna spend a lot more tire time in your career i don't care what you're driving yeah. on quote used tires than you are on new tires and i would always like to practice as close to what you're gonna race as you can and so used tires are the, the way to go. When you bolt on new tires, yeah, you got to be good on new tires too, but you can practice that when you have the luxury to bolt on new tires, then you can go and practice on using that extra grip and feeling that grip. And I will tell you that if you've practiced really well on used tires and can feel those tires and the grip that they're giving you or not giving you, if you learn those techniques to feel the grip when it's low, if you feel the grip when it's high on new tires, you're going to use that grip as well. Um, I mean, I would, I think Colin would tell you some of the best learning he's had is when we would go out in the go-kart track here on the shifter cart and we would put tires on and he would run them and run them and run them and suddenly you know, one of the rear tires with the cords would start to show and it would get really slippery. And he had to figure out how to not use that tire anymore and use the other rear tire, use the front tires harder to change his braking and his steering and cornering technique. And he would keep running and keep running and keep running. And then suddenly the tire would literally blow out and he'd go spinning and we'd go put on some more used tires. He would go run more used tires doing the same thing. And it's, to me, it's exactly the opposite of what James's advisors gave him, you know, spending time on 
used tires is worthless. I would almost say, it's an exaggeration, but spending time on new tires is worthless or worth less than used yeah. tires. I don't know. I think you, I know you agree, but what's the driver's perspective on that? Well, I, I mean, there's two things that I'm thinking about here is, I mean, there are drivers who, because of a lot of times, because of budget reasons, they spend a lot of time on old tires and they finally bolt a set of new tires on and they don't go any faster or yep, we see, they go yep. just a little bit faster because they haven't learned how to take advantage of those new tires. So there is a point in time where you do need to put some new tires on. And so I think, you know, yeah, there's some value to it, but yeah, I'm sitting here going, I'm trying to think of all the laps that I've driven in my life. What percentage of those were on new tires versus old tires? And by the way, a new tire is new for what? A lap? Oh, you know, and, and maybe, I mean, think, maybe a few yeah, laps. Think, think about when you qualify and it depends on your tire. If you have a DOT tire, I'm sure it's different than a race tire, but a new tire is, you know, guys go out to qualify in an IMSA car or even SCCA cars or whatever, and they go out to qualify in new tires. And what's their biggest concern? Okay, what is the lap? There is one lap that's the best. Warm it up for one or two. You know, the next two are going to be the lap, and then they start to fall off. So to me, in most racing tires, new tires are anything between zero and probably five, but let's be generous and say 10 laps. After that, they're used tires. So, yeah, they're, they get used quite fast. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the question mentions 20 heat cycles. Uh, I don't know where that, I don't know where that uh, information comes from, because I think that's going to depend on, <laughs> greatly depend on the tire, right? I mean, there are time tires that might last, might fall off after two or three laps and then get fairly consistent for 20 heat cycles, maybe, and then fall off some more. But some are going to be good for one heat cycle or three heat, heat cycles or whatever. So, well, I'll tell you, when we go with an LMP2 car or, or a GTP or any, any, you know, car like that, when we go to scrub tires, if we just want to take the shine off of them, we're careful not to put a heat cycle into it yeah. because one heat cycle, even if it's only one lap and you got it hot, one heat cycle, and that tire is not as good as a zero heat cycle. So, you know, I'm sure some DOT tires can maybe go, I don't know, 20 heat cycles is not a problem. I don't know. I don't run those tires that much. But, but I, I think the general thing is, the used tire, you're going to learn more. And my question for you, Ross, would be, so let's say you take my advice and you go spend all your time on used tires and you're one of those guys that bolts new tires on and doesn't go faster. What should you be doing when you're on the used tires to be able to take advantage of the new tires? Or how do you take advantage of the new tires? Because I think you'll be better racing on if you practice on used tires. but you're going to qualify maybe on new tires and you don't want to start eighth if you can go a second faster. I mean, we see it all the time, right? With our gentleman drivers, they will tend not to get as much out of a new set of tires, as big a percent increase out of new tires as the pro guys will. Why is that? And how do they get better at that? So one of the questions that I ask a driver in that maybe rare time where they've got a new set of tires is, Really pay attention to what what is the increase in grip. So ask yourself that question. Does it feel and and you know this is a totally gut feel kind of thing, and and your perception is going to be completely different than another driver's perception. But if you say you know I felt like I gained five percent more grip or thirty percent more grip, just file that away so that the next time you do get a new set of tires, you're going. You know, I I should be expecting 30% more grip. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things that I think, well, it's a, it, it's a, 
it's a challenge for, I'm going to say most drivers is how, how do you read that grip level? Like, how do you ask more of a tire? And, you know, there are places where coming out of a corner where you just need to apply the throttle just that tiny bit quicker, harder than you normally would. So you ask more of the rear tires. And if the car still tracks out exactly the way it always has before, guess what? There's more grip. And then ask for more the next time and ask for more the next time until the car then starts to move. And then you go, okay, now I know what I can feel out of the rear. And you do the same kind of thing with the front tires. You're going through a corner and at some point, just add a little steering. If the car just turns more, you're probably not asking enough. If you turn more and the car kind of, you know, there's, there, there's, it's doing something, but it's not like it just dramatically changes direction. You're probably pretty close to the limit. If you turn the wheel and the car does nothing, and maybe if anything, it understeers more, you're probably at, you know, you're starting to exceed the limits of the tires. So file that information away and then start just, you know, building a database of what does, what does a new tire do? Um, and, yeah. and, you know, you should be able to on whatever tires that you're running on, I think you should be able to go from a set of tires that has 20 heat cycles or two heat cycles. I bolt a new set of tires on. You want to get to the point where you can say, I bolt on a new set of tires and the best lap's going to be lap two or lap five. And it's going to have what feels like to me, 2% more grip or 15% more <clears throat> grip, whatever. And mentally, then you're starting with at least, you know, you're, you're, you're starting with a target. Right. Right. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's somewhat hard for the people, the fans on TV to see, but we saw that at this year at Daytona with those GTP cars to, and there was a time I, I know a lot, every GTP car did it, but I happen to have information from Colin, you know, they were on two and a half stint tires. I think he even said it in an interview, you know, that was two and a half stints on a, on a set of tires up against cars with on their first stint on a set of tires. And it's, you know, you just, you just don't have the grip, but they have to drive it. The guy on one stint tires was driving it right to the limit of the grip of his tires. Colin was on two and a half stints was driving it right to the limit of grip on his tires. And you could have popped those two pro guys out, switched them, gave them, switched their tires. And in the first lap, they would both be at the limit of their new tires, the, you know, the tires that they have at that point. I see the really good guys able to drive to the limit of whatever tire it is. It starts to drizzle. They're driving it at the limit. It starts to pour down rain. They're driving at the limit because they feel the grip that each individual tire has at that particular moment. And they adjust not lap by lap or even corner by corner, but like almost foot by foot yeah. of as they go around. And to me, the more the car slides around on used tires, when you're practicing on used tires, the easier it is to kind of feel those limits if the car is stuck on new tires and you're not sure is it the limit here is it the limit there and when you exceed the limit it just spins out because it's like stuck 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 and then it isn't but it, it's why i know you're a huge proponent of driving in the rain because you can feel those limits because it telegraphs it a little more and you can feel the limits in a little longer drawn out scenario used tires does that exactly exact same thing for learning where the limits of the tire are and being comfortable at those limits in my opinion i think you just you know the reason why driving on used tires are, is is so valuable and it's it's almost a little bit like um using the racetrack as a skid pad uh you yeah. get used to yeah. the feeling and, and i think a lot of drivers are uncomfortable with the car moving around it's with it sliding with it doing well if you spend enough time on used tires it's going to slide around and then you get on new tires and you slide around not quite as much, 
but you still get, you're comfortable with it moving around that much. So I think that's the big, big part of it from, I'm going to say from the driving perspective. But the other part of the question is, I think here is, well, how valuable is working on the car setup on used tires? Because can't you, I mean, if you've got old beat up tires that are like on the last, you know, they're falling off the car practically, uh, you tuning the car to that, is that valuable? That's a great question and something that we, as race engineers, are always considering, right? And and the answer is, what's the goal? And that's usually changes, it can change during a weekend. You know, if your goal, if your goal is, I got to qualify on pole. I'm at a, I'm at a race where I know that if I qualify on pole, I'm at a track that's so hard to pass on. Our cars are so hard to pass. I'll take a, I just happen to know like an SRO GT3 race. Man, you cannot pass. The aerodynamically, the cars are so hard to pass. You're at a small, maybe you're at a small track. And so it's all about qualifying. Well, then you're going to qualify in new tires. I'm going to set my car up on new tires. I'm going to optimize it for the grip that new tires has. Try to get the pole and then hope that my car's good enough where they can't pass me because it's going to, I'm going to have to be really slow for those guys to pass me on this track. That's one approach. Now you could be in a, you could be on a GTP car at Daytona where they've given you, IMSA has given you a limited set of number of sets of tires and you know, you're going to have to double stint two and a half stint at sometimes sets of tires. You're going to spend, a majority of your time on more than one stint tires. I'm going to do my setup work on the kind of tires that I'm going to have to race most of the time. I want to be really good for that second stint or the halfway into the first stint to halfway into the second stint. That's where I want to be really good. So I'm going to do my setup work there and not get it dialed in for new tires because that's only going to last for 10 minutes. They're going to my setup's not going to work for the next hour and a half. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be beaten in that hour and a half. So it depends what your goal is. But again, I will say most, you know, if we're using 10 laps as the new tire setup, uh, mo- unless you're in a whatever, a GRC race or something that only is 10 laps, you're not going to spend a lot of time on new tires. I would tend to make my setup work being done on more used tires. And now I'll go to another thing. I've done Ferrari Challenge, fixed length races, 45 minutes. That's it. I would never, and I know I'm going to get new tires after 45 minutes for the next race of that weekend. I would not do setup work on hour and a half old tires. Because my driver's never going to be on hour and a half old tires. He's going to be on someplace between zero and 45 minutes. So there's no sense to be great on hour and a half old tires because I'm never racing anybody on hour and a half old tires. We're all getting new ones at 45 minutes. So I say, look at your goal of what you're trying to do and set your car up for the bulk of your racing time that you're going to be, you know, competitive again. And maybe just touch on it, uh, Jeff. Um, the <clears throat> learn to know what happens with the tires as they go off. Like some setups, you lose the front tires more than you do the rear tires, and some the other way around. And so I'm I'm, I'm thinking that setup wise, you know, if you got a five heat cycles on a set of tires and you know the fronts go off more than the rears then you can factor that in and maybe yeah just i guess touch on that a little exactly bit. yeah yeah it's it's we always a, a big thing when we put new tires on the car from used tires is the first question is how did it change the balance because we know the opposite's going to happen as those wear so let's say the car was let's say we did a good job on our setup on used tires and it's pretty well balanced uh, on after the tires are 15 minutes old until they're an hour and a half old we like the balance it's pretty good now we bolt new tires on and suddenly 
it becomes super understeery. We're like, oh, okay. So I guess what's going to happen is the rear tires, as they age, the rear tires are going to go off. And then it's going to bring us to a good neutral balance. So you can gauge when you put new tires on what's going to happen. Or if you run new tires for a whole stint, you can see what the balance does. And then dial your car in with your sway bars, your tire pressures, whatever works with your car. Dial it in so that the car is balanced correctly when you need to have it balanced correctly. And in an ideal situation, you'll get a car that's maybe a little, maybe not loose, but really grippy and good on new tires. And then maybe goes a little understeery on used tires. Because you don't want the thing to go oversteer and be spinning out on used tires. And so that would be ideally how you would want to set the car up and and try to gauge both of those both of those events, new tires, used tires. It's just but it's a thing, right? I mean, you you'll set it up for used tires. You'll set it up to be, I really need to be good. The other thing is, even in a 45 minute race, if you can stay with the guys, when do you want your best laps to come? At the end, when you're going for the win, right? Yeah. I want to be really good on used tires. So if I can hang with the guy and I know he's not so good on used tires and the last three laps, I'm way better than him. I'm going to win the thing easy. And so it's, there's more to it than just being, getting the right setup for the car. It's for where you want, when you want to be good. Yeah. Well, and I'm, pretty sure that people listening to this uh, budget has nothing to do with it because everybody has the budget to be able to buy as many new tires as they want. I'm sure that's the case. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, where let's you and I will both sign up for that team. If any, anybody yeah. has one of those teams, uh, Ross and I, we're, yeah. we're ready to come and work for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, okay. So we beat tires to death maybe yeah. a little bit. Um, I've got a question for you. Actually, TJ sent it in and it's, I I think it's, I think it's awesome. I'll just get ahead. I'll go ahead and read it. It's a little bit long. The question is, but there's some really good stuff in here. So it's, it's mainly for us. And he says, I get the concept of momentum car as I own a well-prepared NB Miata for HPDEs. I understand how important maintaining your momentum is in a car with very low power, as once you scrub more speed than needed, you'll never gain it back. With a higher powered car, maybe you aren't penalized quite as severely for overslowing the car since you can get back speed a bit easier with more power, question mark. Regardless, you've still lost that speed and will be slower. So my thought is, are all cars not momentum cars in a way? question mark, are the principles of maintaining your momentum not applicable to all cars from a Miata all the way up to an LMP or Formula One car for that matter? Maybe it's more the approach or driving technique that all performance driving is momentum driving and not what we call the cars. All that being said, can you clarify what separates how we should approach driving momentum cars from the rest? What is different? What is the same? This is mainly a driving technique question, but of course, any setup aspects from Jeff are great as well. Wow. Yeah, There's momentum a- cars. We always, I mean, we always talk about, ah, oh, it's a momentum car. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I want to hear your answer too, because aren't they all momentum cars? Yes. All cars are momentum cars. Okay. And and I have a I have a story, and I've told this a few times other places. But uh, I have a story that kind of kind of illustrates this in a fun way. I was doing a driving program for groups of drivers at a track. Uh, well, this had to be six, seven, maybe something like that years ago, and it was at Oregon Raceway Park. Guess what state that's in? And uh, uh, yeah, I have a group of 
six, seven, maybe eight drivers. We're doing a little briefing in the classroom beforehand before I send them out on the track to work on what I've asked them to work on. And I asked the question, how many of you are driving momentum cars? Two hands go up. I go, what are you driving? <laughs> and one driver says, I'm driving a Miata. The other one says, I'm driving a one series BMW. And I kind of look at the other drivers and one of the guys goes, yeah, I, I'm, I have a 650 horsepower Corvette. Kind of like mine's not a momentum car. <laughs> He didn't exactly say that, but that was kind of what he was yeah. inferring, right? You knew what he was thinking. Right? Yeah. And, you know, so we 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 work on things like brake release, on vision, on, on, you know, the line, all sorts of things we've been working on through the morning. And basically what I would do is I would give them some things to go work on as drivers, send them out on the track. They'd come back, we'd debrief. And based on that, I'd give them some other things, just like I would if I was coaching Colin at the track, right? I'd... Mm -hmm. send him out on the track and say, Colin, go work on this. Um, he right. come back and tell me what to do um, because he's, way better than <laughs> me. but, but um, you know, I, I was doing this with a small group of six, seven, eight drivers, something like that. And it was really, it was hilarious because they'd gone on track and I think they'd driven three sessions in the morning and at Oregon raceway park, driving it in the clockwise direction because it's a track that gets driven in both at times they're the sort of the term one, two, two is a 90 degree corner that leads on to a, the longest straight on the track, basically. And this driver driving his Corvette comes up to me after the session and goes, Hey, can you look at my data? Because I just turned the fastest lap I've ever turned. And I want to understand how I did and what I did. And that Corvette, I forget which model it was, but it was that Corvette that has the factory built in Cosworth data oh, yeah. system. Um, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. And um, yeah. it's got video and data built into it. So we're looking at his laps and the minimum speed, his minimum speed in that particular corner. I remember this to this day was 39 miles an hour. And it's like 39, <laughs> miles, an hour, 39 miles an hour because it's a tight, it's a tight corner leading onto the straightaway. 39 miles an sure. hour, 39 miles an hour, 39 miles an hour over and over and over again. One lap, all of a sudden it jumps to 41 miles an hour, his min speed. And uh -huh. looking at the data and listening to the video, you can tell he actually got back on the throttle at the exact same place that he had every other lap. But now he was starting to accelerate from two miles an hour faster. And uh, what was so much fun was because the video actually picked up the audio inside the car and you hear him come out of the corner and you hear him go, yes, <laughs> like like he could feel that he nailed it. And he comes out of the straightaway and goes down the straightaway. <clears throat> and Jeff, I, I, this is one of those things where like if anybody had told me this was the case, I would not have believed it. But his straightaway mm -hmm. speed was nine miles an hour faster than it had been on other laps. And I'm, you know, I, I, I'm I would turn to somebody like you and say, can you show me the math like? Starting two miles an hour faster with a car with that much torque, power, horsepower, and everything. Is that possible that it could make that big a difference? But I saw the data, and that's what it was. Yep. His foot was to the floor all the way down the straightaway from 39 miles an hour min speed to the end of the straightaway, and from 41 to the end. Of the, and it was nine miles an hour difference. And we kind of looked at that, and, we're, and I'm going, you carried 41 miles an hour there. And we then kind of dug into how he made that happen, which was all to do with the timing and rate of release of the brakes. It got the car to rotate into the, through the corner point in the right direction. So he get back to power it, it, and he kind of looks at me and he goes, I guess I'm driving a 650 horsepower momentum car. And I went, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, That's... so yes, TJ, all corner, all cars are momentum cars. If you have a choice of starting to accelerate from a from the minimum speed in the corner from 41 versus 39 or 106 instead of 104, which one do you want to start accelerating from? Now, obviously, if carrying that extra two miles an hour or more delays you dramatically in getting back to throttle, well, that's probably not a good trade-off. But if you're able to carry that that 
extra minimum speed through the corner and still get back to throttle about the same place, then that's that's an advantage. And yes, to your point, I mean, the more power a car has, the more forgiving it is. If you do overslow, you kind of just squeeze down on that throttle a little bit harder or a little bit sooner, and you can kind of make up for that. Whereas if you're in a NB Miata, you can squeeze down on that pedal as hard as you want, but <laughs> it hits the bottom and hits the floor down there. <laughs> and, right. and So that's where yeah. the the term comes from. The you know that term of well, that's a momentum car. That's a you know that's a non momentum car, or uh, you know a point and shoot kind of a car where you can kind of just slow it down, turn it, stand in the throttle, and get out of there. But I will say the very very best drivers. It doesn't matter how much horsepower they have. What separates them from others that are not as good is typically they're able to roll that half mile an hour, maybe a mile an hour more through the middle of the corner, keep the momentum up, still get back to power and, and use that as an advantage. And I actually, Jeff, I remember the day that Colin went and tested a NASCAR cup car for the first time in a road course at VIR. And I get a phone call mm -hmm. and I won't go into the details there, but, you know, I think he was testing that day with uh, Ford had also brought in Boris said um, the road course ringer that back then. And but yep. he was there with Carl Edwards, Matt Kenseth and Greg Biffle and Colin was mm -hmm. the fastest. And it was what he did from the turn in point to just past the apex. He was rolling typically half a mile to a mile an hour more than those other guys. So when he started yeah. to apply the throttle at the exact same place they were, he was starting from, he had an advantage. And right. So is that, is that, I remember that. And I, I, I remember, I mean, that's your, you personally as a coach of, you know, high level pros, I will say they've, you know, they have their, they know where the apex is. They know what they're doing there. You know, you're, I'm talking, you're not coaching, um, you know, like beginner guys, but when you coach high level pro guys, that's where you focus on is that break to the apex of the corner and getting the car clocked and all of that. And so you're really focusing those guys on momentum. I mean, you could be in a GTP car with tons of downforce and lots of power and you're still concerned with how they're carrying that momentum. And is that, is that how you judge it? Is, do you judge it by, by min speed? Is it, is it by definition, if the min speed's higher, he's doing better on carrying momentum? It depends. Yeah. <laughs> I had to, I knew that I had to throw that in there somewhere, right? <laughs> I, I knew that. I teed you up because I knew that was going to be the answer. If <laughs> yeah. you would have said, yes, I would have been, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but I think, you know, the thinking about min speed, your minimum speed in the corner is it's super valuable because it's, it's your min speed can be too low, in which case you're never going to regain that speed, which is what TJ is talking about here with a momentum car. Mm -hmm. It can be too high, in which case you're going to delay being able to get back to power. And even though you're carrying more speed, again, that's not a good trade-off. So your min speed needs to be just right. There's also where in the corner your min speed is, because it can be early oh, in the yeah. corner. It can be in the middle of the corner. It can be late in the corner. I mean, if you go to like just stove in the car into the corner and carrying all this speed into the corner, and as you go past the apex, you slow down, and your min speed is way past the apex, nine times out of 10 or more, that's not a good thing uh, yeah. because it's too late. So there's that as a, as a factor. The other factor is how much time are you spending at min speed? Because, mm. yeah. you know, there are some corners that, you know, a very tight corner, the, the speed kind of typically it's, you know, if you're looking at a speed trace on data, as you know, Jeff, it's, it looks like a V. 
It comes down, it's very yep. pointed, and it goes back up again. In a big, long, fast, sweeping corner, it's more like a big U shape. Mm -hmm. And if you're going through a slow corner and your speed trace looks like a U, you're spending too much time at, at min speed. So I think as a driver, you need to be uh, something to think about is what is your min speed? Where is it? And how long are you spending at it? Uh, I wrote a big, long piece about this a few months ago. And so this is kind of relatively fresh in my mind because I, well, the, the way I learn, the way I think is by writing. So I, I'd mm -hmm. written this piece and it kind of helped me kind of clarify my thinking. But, but, you know, I think kind of going back to the question around momentum is, you know, the other thing you need to think about is what, what is a momentum car? Uh, I like to think about there's a, there's a graph with grip on the Y axis, Y axis and, and power on the, on the uh, X axis and some cars, you know, that the, I'm, I'm drawing it with my hand. That's a beautiful thing about podcasts, right? Um, right, right. You, you, <laughs> You know, you could have it where the the graph, the the slope of the graph is it's it's more pointed towards grip. So you could have a car like a Miata that has a lot of lateral grip, a lot of cornering ability, but not a lot of power. You could have a car, uh, let's just say, like a 650 horsepower Corvette on bad tires. <laughs> right. Because of course that that Corvette does grip or corner really well as well, but think about it as having bad tires. There there is a case right. where the cornering grip is pretty low, but lots of power. Uh, so you know how you would drive that 650 horsepower Corvette if it had like really bad tires on it was you'd go. I don't want to spend a lot of time cornering because I don't have a lot of cornering power or grip. So you would come into that corner break it, slow it down, turn the thing as sharp as you can almost, point it in the other direction and blast out of there. It's kind of like one drag strip, turn it, another drag strip. Whereas right. in that exact right. same corner with the Miata, you kind of almost want to drive this big, long arc through that corner. So that's the the approach uh, of, of the difference between those two, I think. And... You know, then it comes down to well, how do you do that? Well, you know, you know my usual uh, response. Other than the, it depends, it's going to be. It all comes down to the timing and rate of release of the brakes, because that's where the. Yep. That's where that's where, um, and this is something that Colin helped me figure out when we spent a lot of time working on his timing and rate of release of the brakes. It's. I remember one time him talking to me about, you know, I want to get. I'm paraphrasing what he said there, but it was kind of almost like he's saying. You know, I want to get most of my braking done early. So when I get down to that very towards the turn in point, I use that last little tiny bit of the brake zone to fine tune my speed and the load balance of the car. Because if it's a very tight corner, I want to use that to help me turn the car. And if it's a less than tight corner, I want to kind of come off the brakes and get the car more flat and balanced so I can use all the cornering grip. And so, but he really used that the end of the brake zone as a fine tuning tool. And I think most drivers think about the brakes as I'm just going to brake as late as hard as I can. And they don't think enough about that end of the braking part, which is where the, is where the magic all happens. Yeah. Yeah. I know you're, you're super big on that. And I've seen, I've seen you coach a lot of drivers about that part of it. And that to me that I, I've looked at a lot of data, obviously, and that whole part of the break zone is what separates the good from the really, really good. If they get that right. And it also helps me as an engineer make the car allow them to be able to carry more momentum or more min speed. Because if they break that way, they're not upsetting the car so much. It's not, you know, they're not as sharp on it. They're getting that release. They're not just popping off the brake. They're kind of coming off the brake. And, and, and also, it can give you, it can give the engineer a good insight into what the car is really doing. 
because if I see, oh, now he's, you know, we're like, oh, I think that was a little more understeery, hard to tell, tires were worn out a little bit more, it's, uh, it's really hard to say. But if you see them hanging on the brake a little bit longer there, it's probably telling you, yeah, they're trying to keep some more weight on the load on the front to make it turn better. Yeah, I'm going to go with it probably was a little more understeering, even though they it was very slight. Guys were really good modulating that brake at the end. It's a it's a telegraph of what they're doing, even though they're mentally maybe not thinking about it. It's just how they feel it. And they're telling you by their brake trace. You know, the, the, I just, as you were saying that, I'm thinking that's a whole other conversation that we should record sometime. The telltale signs that data often shows, like sometimes you can look at, you can look at a, at a, you know, speed throttle and brake. If you, if you look at those traces, you can go, the driver's scared or they're lacking confidence. Right. right. You know, right. or. Right. They're trying to make up for something that they haven't reported in terms of the handling. Yep. And yep. I, that would be, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're, we, we, we did this before we can go off topic for, I got one up. This just is, this is the, this is a good one. I'm going to go okay. off topic, but on that topic. Okay. Price Cobb taught me, Price Cobb taught me this. And Price Cobb, Lamar winner, for the people that don't know who Price Cobb is and haven't heard about him, hit Google, look at Wikipedia. The guy was, he's done it all. Yep. Super, super cool guy too. But, and uh, we're, we're still in touch, but that's a whole different story. So I'm doing a Trans Am car. Price is driving. I'm at Race Engineering. We're at Road Atlanta. We're going, we're trying to get turn one right at Road Atlanta. And in, in this era, trans, well, probably in any car. That's a, not a straightforward corner. It's, it's, you know, drivers working down a gear. Oh, it's pretty fast uphill. Lots of things going on. Big old Trans Am car, stick axle, rear end, you know, back in those days. And I'm trying to get it right. And I say, well, what? I mean, I don't get it, Price. What do you need? What do you want? He goes, well, look at the data. And I said, no, no. I mean, what do you want? He goes, well, the data will tell you what I want. And I'm like, I don't get it. So we sat down and he goes, all right, I turn the steering wheel like this, how this many degrees, right? And then for a split second, it's held with that many degrees. And then I do this and that with the steering wheel. And I'm doing this and that with the brakes. And I said, yeah, I know, but I see that. But what do you want? He goes, what I want is that first steering wheel angle. When I turn the steering wheel, that's what I want. Then I see what I'm actually getting and I do all that other jazz because I'm not getting what I want. I'm like, oh, and it dawned on me. That's pretty common. The first thing what the driver wants, because he doesn't know what he's going to get yet when he turns into a corner. That's what he wants. And anything that, you know, if that's pretty consistent through the corner, he's probably got what he wanted. And so I've always used the data to help me with the drivers. And there's an example of what does he want the car to do? He wants the car to do this and then it does something different. And so that's just one story along that. You're right. We could do a whole podcast on that. Yeah, actually. Yeah. And I spent a season with Price where we were running a former Atlantic team together. And, and uh, uh, I, I'd say Price was one of those rare drivers who would often refer to the data uh, before, you know, a lot of drivers would go, ah, the data, it's lying. Uh, you know, I was flashed right. with that corner, right? Price, <laughs> right? Price was one of the the early few drivers who would just go, what's the data tell me or say that I'm doing? Um, yep. he, he really was uh, a big advocate for that. So um, yeah. used it as a used it as a tool. James Weaver is the other guy. Yeah, 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 that same thing. yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. man, I can tell some stories about James and I comparing data and stuff like that. When you could, James and I driving very, very, very similar cars, same types of cars in IMSA, and uh, you probably couldn't find two more different driving styles than James's driving really? style and my driving style. And yet, wow. so many times we'd be like, you know, hundreds of a second apart, very, uh -huh. very different ways of getting there. So it was, it was wow. fun. 
I knew I was in trouble when James would walk up with his shock dino sheet and say, hey, here's my shock dino sheet. I just built these shocks and dino them myself. What do you think about the nose at a half an inch per second? <laughs> think I should have more or less? I'm like, wait, you're, and you're the driver, right? And he's like, yeah, but, you know, I think it should, like, whoa, okay, this guy's really into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you're right. We did kind of go a little bit of a off on a tangent from TJ's question about momentum cars, but I think you're right. TJ is is all cars are, mo- are momentum cars. Some cars, um, it it it's going to have a bigger impact. But I think when you start thinking about that min speed thing, of uh, is it too little? Is it too much? Is it in the right place in the corner? And how long am I spending at at min speed? I think that's a that's a that's a big part of uh, part of it, really. And yeah, think about using the brake as a tool to help you fine tune what the speed is, the momentum is that you're carrying through the corner. That's a good Makes start, sense. anyways. Makes sense. Yeah. 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 Good. Good. Well, that was fun. We got to answer some questions and tell stories. Yeah. It's a good. Good episode. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, and and you know what? I think we might have two listeners. You and me. Right. right. At least I learned something. So that was yeah. that was good. That was yeah. good. Well, we uh yeah, and if anybody's got any more questions, um and none of them are dumb because that's they can't be. So send in any questions. Um you know how to get a hold of Ross. I'm on social media here and there and emails at the track is really cool. I love people coming up and saying, Hey, I got a question for you at the track. That's happened a lot lately. So season's just starting. So hit us up and uh, uh, we'll answer some more questions because it's a, it's a blast. I enjoy doing it. So Jeff, if I come up to you at Sebring because you're engineering Mm -hmm. an LMP two car and I'm coaching a competitor in an LMP2 car, right. if I come up to you and I say, Jeff, can you give me your setup sheet? Uh, mm-hmm. Would that be considered a dumb question? Nope, nope. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to give it to you. I'll, I, I'll go back and get the fake one that I throw <laughs> on the ground and leave around in the garbage cans for everybody, and I'll right. give that to you. It's You know how it goes, Ross. I, I know. I've, people I'd be talking to, it happened just recently, I was talking to Bill Riley, and... I left from talking to him and somebody said, Hey, what were you guys talking about? I said, we weren't talking. We're just lying to each other. Like we always do. Yeah. So yeah. That's what a lot of the talk at the racetrack is. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Good questions. Okay. And uh, so let's wrap this up. And as usual, everybody keep having fun out there. Keep learning too. have fun. Yep. Learn, have fun, go fast. 